Hello, everybody. My name is Marcus T. Anthony. Welcome to my presentation for the annual conference in the Society for Consciousness Studies. So my talk is called Embodiment, Classical Intuition, and the Future of the Metaverse, which is a very topical issue right at the moment. So um, this is basically, uh, I think, seven parts of this presentation. The first part is I'm going to just mention a bit about myself. Then I'm going to mention a little bit about critical future studies, the context, which is about the metaverse embodiment and the crisis in sense making. I'm going to uh, outline what I call deep futures and money and machines futures, integrated intelligence and the extended mind. Then I'm going to introduce uh, four scenarios, which is uh, something that futurists uh, tend to like to. Those scenarios will be about the future of the metaverse. And in my conclusion, I'm going to talk about uh, rediscovering the authentic self in relation to the metaverse. Okay, so um, I think it is a bit important to mention something about myself, but it's rather important. I work in China at the moment. I've been working in China for the last five years, five and a half years, and I've been coming and going from China for, well, since 1999, really. And I teach uh, future studies and sense making in the digital age. Uh, the fourth industrial revolution and a few other programs at the beijing institute of technology in Zhuhai, which is near uh, not far from hong kong actually and i'm a regular presenter for the asia pacific futurist network so Zhuhai is uh, about one hour by boat from hong kong if you go across this large um very long bridge which i believe is the longest bridge in the world you'll end up in hong kong in about uh, 30 minutes and Zhuhai is right on the coast, uh, so it's a very scenic place and desirable place to live. So that's where I am at the moment. So uh, because I'm talking about the future of the metaverse in relationship to the body and intuitive intelligence, I really need to tell you a little bit about my story. Um, before I do that, though, I should mention, I'm not going to mention or talk about every single piece of information that's on my slides. Uh, if you want to, you can stop this presentation and um, and read the slides if you want to, but I'm not just gonna read the slides uh, because there's a bit too much information on them. And uh, if you want more details, you can, you can stop them and have a look. Otherwise, I'm just gonna mention the main things. So forgive me if I skip over a few things that are actually written on, on the slides. So at the age of 26, which was more than half a lifetime ago now, I had a, what I would call an awakening experience which wasn't a classical um, non-dual experience. It was more involved the opening of uh, intuitive intelligence. And very specifically, it was the opening of, of the third eye. Um, I'm not gonna go into what that entailed, but basically it meant that uh, I began to experience uh, uh, visionary states and mostly through meditation, uh, light trance states. I also recorded dreams for many years. And uh, as I gleaned the information, from these um, alternative uh, sources of information, I found that I had uh, access to a lot of uh, information which would might, not, might be considered illegitimate in mainstream circles, but which I believe, strongly believe, are, are legitimate forms of knowledge. Um, now, about four years later, I moved to New Zealand and I did a lot of healing work on my body, which I think really connected me to the somatic body which is really the emotional body and that really helped my understanding of the intuitive mind also uh, when i was 35 i went to the university of the sunshine coast in australia and started studying this more formally in uh, when, I, when i did my doctorate there and i studied under uh, sohail in Aitala, who's the unesco chair in future studies <clears throat> so i then studied it formally so as well as you know the the intuitive or first person part of the experience of what I call integrated intelligence. And I employed that also in my research. So when I would do research, I use my intuitive uh, knowledge and processes in order to uh, guide my research. And then I set about writing a few books <clears throat> and publishing around 50 articles in mostly in future studies. And so now I've ended up here in China in the Beijing Institute of Technology in Zhuhai. And what I'm presenting here is part of the Power and Presence Project, which is a book I'm, which will be coming out uh, next year. 
So what is critical future studies? I'm going to very briefly outline what, what critical future studies is. Well, it's, it's not merely about trying to predict the future, which is what some people think. It's about analyzing the way we think about the future and uh, trying to change it. And also looking at how a power works within futures, within our discussions of the future. So who has the privilege? Um, who gets to have a say and who doesn't? And why we may think that the future is set when it really isn't. So according to Sahel and Atala, there's um, six parts or pillars to, to future studies. And they're mapping the future, which is uh, working out the steps about from, from the past history, the present, and then possibly into the future. And anticipating the future is prediction. Timing is working out when you think things might happen. Might happen. Deepening is really broadening the future so that we, we don't just think about it in, in, in narrow context or what everybody thinks it's going to be about, which is usually about technology uh, in popular discourses. And then it's about creating alternatives. What are some other ways that we can look at the future, not just what you see in science fiction movies or mainstream discussions? And transforming the future is the last part. So that means we, we change, we can, we can deliberately change direction if we want to. Okay, so what is the context of this discussion I'm going to bring about uh, the metaverse embodiment and the crisis uh, in sense making? I'm going to explain what that means. So in case you've been uh, off the internet for six months, uh, you may have seen this picture over here on the right hand side, which is Mark Zuckerberg, the CEO of Facebook. And this is what I call, um, well, I would call it a meme, which is a very popular idea on the internet now, which is a lot of people are very critical about this idea of the metaverse. And uh, they're worried that it may develop into some kind of dystopian future. So really this is the race for the development and control of VR and, and AR. And it's not just about Facebook, there are other companies also involved, okay. The criticism is basically that the uh, metaverse appears to be a monetized, all immersive environment. So basically, the fear is we're not going to be able to get out of it. Okay, um, so what is the relationship between the metaverse and our sense of embodiment or our connection to the body? And especially to the intuitive knowledge that uh, is associated with traditional forms of knowledge, especially in the awakening the traditions and uh, into the future what form is this likely to take can we actually uh, readily access these kinds of intu intuitive processes in the in the metaverse i know I, I can't really answer that question specifically but i'm just going to look at some of the factors that may impact that as we go along and some of the scenarios okay so in mark zuckerberg's metaverse um he intends to transform uh, Meta, as Facebook was called, into a metaverse company over five years. So it'll be a 3D, uh, all immersive uh, internet. And you'll be in the internet and you'll be part of it. And according to what he says, it'll be difficult to distinguish it from the real world. And he actually said in an interview in August of this year that there'll be no logging off which of course rang a few alarm bells for some people. Now Horizons Workrooms is uh, basically uh, Meta's version of, um, of Zoom, which is what I'm using right now. It's like a 3D Zoom. So this is a big part of the metaverse, according to Facebook. So it includes work and business and entertainment. So it's all immersive and it's monetized. So, uh, so it's the, pl the plan is to engineer this. It's an augmented virtual reality. Money, uh, money, economy, and media, entertainment all get put together in one, one virtual space. Okay, and uh, Facebook isn't the only company doing this. Uh, Microsoft, Rob, uh, Rob, uh, Roblox, Epic Games, and other companies. Are, and there's going to be many companies getting into this. It's going to be big business. That's almost certain. So the very probable future will involve something along these lines. How exactly it unfolds? Well, I'm suggesting that we have choices. And uh, the context of this is that we're increasingly becoming uh, cyborg um, organisms. Neuralink, for example, uh, Elon Musk's Neuralink is a company when planting chips into brains. And um, 
there are other companies working on brain uh, machine interfaces. They're not, they're not all inserted into the head or the body. Some are just like taps around your skull. Um, but it seems increasingly unlikely that, likely that this will be the future, will become more cyborg-like. So um, it appears we're becoming more disembodied and more disconnected from this, the somatic body and, in, and intuition. We're overstimulated and drowning in dopamine, okay? And we're losing connection with, our, with, our, with the, the emotional and the intuitive body and the wisdom that this is normally connected with. So I believe this is a, a loss of connection with the authentic self, what I call the authentic self, which is what I'll explain a bit more about at the end of the presentation. So this is all happening amidst what I call the crisis in sense making. So I'm going to flip through a, a few screens here, outlining some of the main features of what I call the crisis in sense making. So it's becoming more difficult to make sense of the world and what it really means to be human. Okay. As we become more virtual and disembodied. So there's a confusion about what's true and what's real. We're losing trust in the media and in each other. We're losing trust in institutions and governments. There's a rapid uh, increase in the uh, spread of disinformation. There's a meaning crisis. So as uh, we lose faith in traditional religions and traditions of, uh, in our institutions, um, we don't quite know who to turn to. Do we turn to tech giants and people like Steve Jobs, Elon Musk? Now, there's a certain amount of projection which occurs when we look at some, some of the media and social media images of these people. Computational warfare, there's disinformation everywhere. Um, a lot of misinformation, a lot of bot uh, interference in uh, the major discourses on the internet, on Facebook and, and Twitter and other places. Elections appear to be being interfered with as well. This is a big problem. There's a lack of shared agreement about what's, what's important. We're spending far more time online, especially in the age of COVID. And tribalism and online conflict are on the rise, as we all know. There's a, this increased pessimism and the culture of doomsdayism. So as the boomers fade into the sunset, the boomers are taking over. And it's becoming increasingly important to know when not to use technology. And this is what I would call an implicit trend. I think we're starting to realize this. We can't just let technology lead us. We have to lead technology. So what's my central argument today? And I've taken a bit of a while to uh, get around. It's basically this. It's extremely important to retain a strong sense of embodiment and intuitive intelligence as the 3D digital society evolves, which is basically the metaverse. Um, to further diminish that awareness of the intuitive nature of the mind and now intuitive and somatic wisdom, I think would perpetuate a civilizational, a major civilization, civilizational era that we're currently in the midst of, and it's so pervasive that we don't see it. And it was part of, um, I'm not going to trace the history of that in this presentation, but we can think of it going back way through history, maybe through the scientific enlightenment and the Darwinian evolution and its rejection of um, the more romantic or embodied or nature-based um, cultures and ways of knowing, which I think are extremely important. I think science is extremely important, rationality extremely important, but we have to balance it. And if we keep doing this, I believe the results could be catastrophic. We need to establish ourselves in the authentic self and via embodied presence. That's my main argument. Okay, so the authentic self is the wiser or more present and grounded aspect of ourselves. And many of us don't experience this readily in the modern age. And it's something you can experience through deep presence and meditation and connection with nature. Okay, so it's the mindful relaxation at the present moment. Okay, what about deep futures versus money and machine futures? So this is a distinction that I've made in some of my research. So, uh, 
There's something I call the descent in the utopia. This is where basically where technology and economy and the capitalism takes over. So we have societies that are very heavily based in technology and online worlds. Um, so I call this a, these money and machine futures, and they're imbalanced, imbalanced, and we lose connection with the rationality. They're very materialistic. They're centered in distraction and amusement. Okay. Now, money and machines futures, um, they're overly materialistic. Power and wealth tends to be concentrated into a few people. They lack uh, psychological depth and mindfulness. And they especially lack a connection with the, the more spiritual and intuitive aspects of, of consciousness. So people live in a state of amused distraction. And anxiety and depression uh, may be linked to this. Okay? Not everyone agrees that it is, but there are many that do. Deep futures, on the other hand, we can contrast with this. So in, to me, this is a more preferable future. We maintain um, the connection with, with material well-being. And there's nothing wrong with itself, I don't think, with wanting to have uh, material assets. But we also need to connect with nature and sustainability. We need to look after the world, look after each other. We need psycho-spiritual perspectives. And we need to ask deeper questions about what it means to be human. Okay. Okay, so that's, that's deep futures. So what is uh, integrated intelligence in the extended mind? Well, this is part of, an, of the, the deep futures that I'm talking about. So in, integrated intelligence, and this is something I've been researching for a long time. It's basically the same thing as classical intuition, which suggests that consciousness and the way that we know the world is not simply located in the mind as an isolated um, distinct entity. The mind is actually connected with nature. It has non-local properties through space and time. A contrast with what I call mundane models of intuition, such as you look at, at Malcolm Gladwell's book, Blink, which is a fam famous book about intuition. That's a, a mundane model of intuition. Munda mundane models do not acknowledge the, ex the extended mind as a non-local, as the non-local mind. They see intuition as still uh, brain-based. I believe that's a valid form of intuition, but it doesn't go far enough. Okay. So integrated intelligence is very common through many uh, discourses through history, ancient, the ancients, indigenous cultures, depth psychology, religious in, introspections and traditions, parapsychology, uh, new age, near-death experiences, dreams. Some of these discourses may be more valid than others, but they all feature integrated intelligence. Integrated intelligence is the deliberate use of, 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 of this form of knowing. So it comes into consciousness. It's not just something that happens unconsciously, but it's fuzzy by nature, so it's hard to measure. And it often re uh, requires uh, not ordinary, ordinary states of consciousness. Now in the research that I posited, especially in, a, in my PhD thesis and my book, Integrated Intelligence, is that um, there are at least seven uh, ways of knowing which are included, which is um, which are the following. Synthesis is the sense of connection between things. Evaluation is where we find importance. We understand intuitively what's important and not important, and we find meaning. And it's through uh, an intuitive sense. It's not necessarily something directly rational. Four senses are a sense of what might happen in the future. This might include direct precognition or present. It's just the feeling of what's going to happen. Location is a sense of where to go next or where you can find the answer to a problem. Diagnosis is an intuitive understanding of what the cause of a problem is. Deep empathy is really how we connect with other people and we can feel and sense uh, what they sense at a non-local and they uh, respect, respect. And also in uh, inspiration and innovation and creativity, you often find uh, the idea of integrated intelligence in those discourses. And all these things actually apply to mundane mainstream science models as well of intuition. But in, 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 in integrated intelligence, they incorporate the non-local mind. Okay. So 
here are two, two models of the extended mind. So this, this is something I'm going to quickly go over. I'm not going to go through all the details of this. I'm just going to quickly skip over it. So this is really the difference between synchronization of the brain or brains and entanglement. And this is the difference really between mundane models of intuition and, uh, and classical uh, models of intuition. Okay, so there's some recent experiments uh, uh, and understandings in the extended mind. This is what I call model one. Okay, this is mainstream science. This is how our brains synchronize with each other and with um, cultures that we're embedded within. Um, so our brains in this model are not just simply, our minds in this model are not simply located in our head because what we say, what we do, how we act, synchronizes our brains with other people's brains in, other, in our own society or the groups of people that we're immediately interacting with, okay? But this doesn't include non-local consciousness. It's purely mainstream science. Um, for example, Ton Pro S uh, in Japan, he says that human uh, brains are intimately, intimately connected, okay? At the neuronal level, okay? So, um, how we interact with other people uh, structures the way our brains uh, in, uh, are shaped and how we think and how they function internally. Uh, so this is a ma still mainstream science here. Now, forgive me for just skipping over some of this. Um, so this is scientifically well established. Now, this is not controversial or very controversial. Things that, are, that can be synchronized include human footsteps, our conversations, our heart rates. Um, when we do cognitive tasks together, such as play games, our brains tend to synchronize. But when we compete against each other in our brains, that synchronization collapses. Okay, so there's a alignment of neural frequencies in the brain when we work together. And this is demonstrated through you know, EEG, FRMI, FNIRS scans, all, all in support of this. For example, when pilots and co-pilots work together, people work together in completing puzzles, we can all see the evidence of this. Okay, another example of this is Annie Murphy's, um, Annie Murphy Paul's intuitive intelligence. And I'm not gonna go over this, if you want to read the screen, you can, but she's come to a similar Conclusions. Okay. Um, a good example experimentally of, of this uh, mundane form of intuition, if you like, it comes from uh, Antonio Damasio, he's a very famous neuroscientist at USC. Um, in this game that was conducted uh, uh, virtually on, I mean, it's basically on computer screens, participants were given 2,000 virtual dollars and four decks of cards. And they had to pick um, card, uh, cards from decks which were concealed. So the piles of virtual cards, right? So they had to flip the cards and they could win or lose money um, depending on which deck they, they or card they, they selected. But the players weren't informed that decks A and B and out of the four had more penalties. So there were some decks that were loaded to be more punitive and decks C and D were more positive, okay? You can get more money basically in the long run. So what happened in this game? Well, the interesting thing is that the player's um, physiology responded um, to to the to the to the negative decks more. So basically, stress levels, as indicated by skin conductance, spiked just before people were, um, the players went to pick up. Uh, cards from the from the negative decks. Okay, this happened after a while. So the body started to respond to the negativity and the, the positive, or the reward and punishment, if you like. And this is long before they they consciously knew about this information. So when the, the game was stopped and they were asked which decks are, are better or, or worse, they they weren't sure, but their body was already responding to it. So this is just one example of how um, the body can know things when the mind doesn't. And this suggests it's how very important it is for us to stay connected to, to the body and the intuitive knowledge, because you can connect into this. And Annie Murphy Paul um, agrees with that as well. So that's actually mainstream science. 
Um, the other model of the extended mind, which many people at the, um, watching this video will be familiar with, so it's familiar with, so I won't labor on it too much, it does involve uh, uh, the non-local non influence. And you can see this in the work of Rupert Sheldrake, Dean Raid, and Stephen Schwartz, Deepak Chopra. It's been in many other discourses, uh, as I mentioned, over the years. And traditional religions, spiritual traditions, all feature this kind of, of knowing. But it's generally not accepted. Um, for example, in the Tao Te Ching, chapter 47, uh, written, uh, well, not written, it was possibly written or uh, spoken by, uh, by Lao Tzu. He may, he's possibly a mythical figure who lived about 2,600 years ago in China. He said, without stepping out the door, we can know the world. Um, without looking through the window, you can see heaven's way. The longer you travel, the less you know. So the sage knows of that traveling, perceives without looking, completes without acting. So this suggests that there's a, um, a kind of local, non-local mind that even the ancients were aware of. Now, if you look at both the uh, model one and model two of uh, the extended mind, both agree that the, the somatic, somatic aware, awareness connected to the body is really important. Okay. And intuition is really important. Perhaps advocates of the second model uh, emphasize more images, sounds, and thoughts. Um, so it's really important that the metaverse, as it develops, doesn't uh, forget about the body and introspection. We have to include um, uh, uh, interoception, connection with the body and its feelings, not just extraception, which is the uh, perception of what occurs outside us. Okay. And the important thing with uh, the internet, of course, is that the external a stimuli that we get is often mediated by other people and algorithms which are out of our control and there may be an agenda for power and control for all kinds of reasons um, so we have to be very careful that we don't give our power away to that external source of information okay I'm, I'm, I'm kind of running out of time here so i'm just going to quickly go through one last part uh, four scenarios and now I'm, I'm a futurist so uh, scenarios in future studies uh, are not predictions. We use scenarios basically for planning and thinking about the future and deepening the future. So because they're kind of disruptive. So we don't just imagine what we believe is gonna happen or what is generally accepted. We start to think of alternatives. In the context of the metaverse and the intuitive mind, um, there's four scenarios that I've come up with, which I'm gonna outline in a moment. Okay, uh, so, and they also help us to think clearly about undesirable futures, which kind of futures do we want to go for? Okay, and scenarios also help us to stretch the mind, okay? Now, one thing that was, was mentioned by Stephen uh, Tai, who, um, who wrote a very book, good book, I think it's, which is called, um, thinking strategy or something like this. I forgot, it's in, it's in my last slide, Stephen Tai, he's a futurist. He points out that when we're thinking about futures, some, some of the scenarios may seem a bit crazy, but it's good to, to remember that not that long ago, um, the future that we, that we experience now as the present would have appeared to be ridiculous to, uh, um, to people from the past. And when we look at futures, say from, let's say uh, in medical uh, practices. You know, 150 years ago, doctors didn't even wash their hands. Not that long ago, uh, doctors were advertising cigarettes. And this, this seems crazy to us today, but so it's important to include some more alternative futures. And we don't necessarily just dismiss scenarios because they don't seem uh, plausible to us. Now, two-factor scenarios is where you plot Two, two, uh, two factors against each other. And that's what I'm doing here with my, my, my scenarios. Okay. So one factor really should be something that's highly certain, and that's going to be the metaverse or metaverses, which I believe are very highly likely to occur and be um, more immersive in the near future. But, um, but also immersion in uh, integrated intelligence, which is a less certain one, but I think important and immersion in the somatic body. So I'm going to 
look at these two factors that are juxtaposed with each other. Okay, so it's the degree of immersion in the metaverse versus the degree, degree of immersion um, in the body and integrated in functions. So when I put these two together, so when I put immersion um, uh, with the metaverse, okay, versus um, the intuition, I come up with these four. This is how I get these uh, four, four scenarios. Okay. Uh, so the first one that we come up with basically is on the top left-hand corner is this Snow Crash Wonderland, which is more or less the matrix. People have high immersion in the internet or the metaverse, but very low self-awareness and connection with the body. So basically you, you lose connection to the spirit. So this is the dystopia that people are, are worried about. The bottom left-hand corner, uh, you have low immersion in the internet and low connection to intuition. But this is basically a throwback to the, <clears throat> well, I'd say the 1970s maybe. This is what I call a Brady Bunch branches. So it's basically uh, uh, a kind of, uh, shall we say, a less a less aware society, but we're still not immersed in the internet. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a used future, going back to the past. Uh, the bottom right hand corner, back to the body. Now, this is a low immersion in the internet, but high levels of connection to the body. So this is uh, perhaps a utopian future in a way where we, we do away or reduce the, or, or abandon the idea of the metaverse, but we connect deeply with the body. Um, is this likely to happen? Probably not. It probably won't be a uh, dominant future. Um, sorry. But the mindful metaverse is, the, is a what I would call a preferable future, where you have high immersion in the metaverse, but elevated levels of integrated intelligence. So basically you get to use the internet, but the system acknowledges the importance of the intuitive and the spiritual, and, and we are encouraged to maintain that connection with the body. So it's kind of the best of both worlds. So we shouldn't assume that the future of the metaverse is going to be something terrible. But in order for this to happen, of course, uh, the, the big tech companies have to perhaps transform their culture and it has to become more transparent. The value structures that, that are underpinned by the machinations of the, the algorithms have to become more transparent. Otherwise, it, it reverts back into snow crash wonderland. So they're my four scenarios. So I've got to finish up here. If you want to, you can read through these four scenarios in more detail. Snow crash wonderland. Uh, Brady Bunch Brunches, Back to the Body, and Mindful Metaverse. Okay. So my conclusion is this. It's important that we rediscover the authentic self. Okay. So the authentic self is a deeper sense of self, as I said. Um, it's, it's closer to the idea from traditional awakening uh, uh, processes and, and cultures, you know, in, in the East, perhaps, but also in, the, in many traditions, the Christian traditions also, depth psychology, Jungian psychology, and it involves the connection with the intuitive self, with the authentic self, okay? It's important that we, we maintain an understanding of what this is. Now, in order to do this, we basically, I've argued that we have, there are five foundations of this embodied presence and integrated intelligence, which I've kind of gone through already. Cognitive responsibility also very important. We have to be able to res be responsible and witness what occurs in our own minds and what arises within it, especially as we work through online environments. And very crucially, we need to have mastery of the system. This includes mastery of online systems. We have to know and understand how these, the metaverse works, how our, our brains can be hooked in and become addicted to um, these systems and how we can be manipulated uh, by all these actors, good, uh, bad faith actors can manipulate us on the internet. It's really important that the actions that we take in the world and online uh, lead to wise, to wise action, okay? So these are the foundations of good sense making, I believe, into the future.
Okay, so I'm going to skip this part. So this is really all about empowerment, because if we give our power away to the metaverse and the internet, that's a dystopian future. But general empowerment means that we stay connected to the, the authentic self and we stay connected to our bodies and our intuition. And who we are as human beings remains uh, grounded in something deeper than, our, than the individual self and deeper than is the capitalist um, system. Okay. So I'm not going to uh, mention anything. I'm just going to finish up here. Okay. You can read through these slides if you want to. The key question is, who am I really? And what kind of person do I really want to be? And that's really an introspective thing. It would be very important that online worlds don't drag us away from that. Okay, so there's a few references if you want to read them. And uh, a few references by other, other writers and thinkers. So I'm gonna finish up here. So thank you very much. Uh, for listening to this presentation and uh, I'll see you around again in the future.